Tonight we're in a former mining town, just as the government's given the green light to the country's first coal mine in 30 years. What does that say about the government's green credentials? Tonight we are in Bishop Auckland in County Durham. In 2019, this place elected its first ever Conservative MP after decades of Labour dominance. Also tonight, will the millions going on strike paralyse the country? And have you been watching Harry and Meghan on TV today? Welcome to Question Time. Panel tonight, Guy Opperman, the Employment Minister. He spent 20 years as a barrister before becoming the MP for Hexham in Northumberland in 2010. He's also a keen amateur jockey, riding a winner as recently as 2019. Labour's Lucy Powell is Shadow Secretary of State for Digital, Culture, Media and Sport, to give you her full title. She's also been the MP for Manchester Central for a decade and has previously shadowed education, housing and business for Labour. Stuart Hosey is a former deputy leader of the Scottish National Party and one of the 44 strong SNP MPs, the third biggest party in the Commons. He's also the party's Westminster campaign coordinator for Scottish independence. Isabel Oakshot is a scoop getter and feather ruffler. Well, that's what she calls herself on Twitter. Currently Talk TV's international editor. She's also written several books. Her most recent was written with Matt Hancock, his pandemic diaries. And the award-winning fashion designer and businessman Patrick Grant is no stranger to the lights of a TV studio. He's one of the judges on the Great British Sewing Bee and has built a large business empire in fashion and textiles. Welcome to our panel, welcome to our audience here in Bishop Auckland and of course welcome to you at home. Join in the conversation the usual way on social media at BBC Question Time. Let's hear what you've got to say and remember not only are we on after the 10 o'clock news as usual, but we are also live on the iPlayer at 8 o'clock, just in case after news is a bit too late for your bedtime. So, let's have our first question show, which is from Shan Twins. The nurses, pandemics, postal workers, train drivers, lecturers and many more are on strike. The country is crying out for support to survive. Is Britain broken? Uh, what do you think, Shan? Um, a thousand percent. Uh, I think that the way that we're talking about this is that we're forgetting that public service workers are also members of the public as well. And the fact that nurses are using food drives, food banks and things like that is appalling. And the way the Prime Minister is talking about it is equally as appalling. Equally as appalling, Guy. So, um... <laughs> Clearly, we support all public workers we are very much of the case that we need to try and resolve the strikes that are going on it is absolutely the case that there has been a degree of support over the last year you look at the energy price support uh, the energy support guarantee scheme uh, the council tax reduction that all of the citizens of this country have had but there are independent pay review bodies and that is the key thing the word is independent and we believe it is right and proper that the independent pay review bodies bring forward uh, their views in terms of how it is pay should be determined and that we go from there. At the same stage, we are trying our hardest to get inflation under control and some of the uh, requests for pay rises are simply unsustainable in the circumstances that exist in the country today where money is tight and when the public sector money is tight as well. So why is it the, the criminal barristers who went on strike in October, they, they got a 15% pay rise. That was affordable. But for nurses who are asking for a bit more than that, that's not affordable. So the, the nurses are asking for over 17%. The criminal barrister scheme is quite complicated, but bluntly that was a backdated award over several years. It is not the case that that is a simple 15% uh, rise on a present basis. Lucy. Well, I, I agree very strongly with the sentiment of the, of the question. You know, these are unprecedented uh, strikes that we're seeing. I think nurses have never gone on strike in their entire history. They've never voted for that. It wasn't that long ago we were all clapping and celebrating our public sector workers for doing all the jobs that we needed them to carry on doing during the COVID uh, pandemic. And you know, the government needs to get round the, the table and have some proper negotiations. Obviously, you can't just meet demands on this television show or whatever and for course, the particular... And of course, Wes Streeting, who's the Shadow Health Secretary, said that 
19% uh, for nurses is just too much. Oh, it, it, it probably is unaffordable. It, it's it's probably un unaffordable. But get round the table because this is completely uh, unprecedented and it's happening under this Conservative government's watch. And it's not just a short term thing, it's not just because we've seen inflation uh, uh, spiking just in the last few months and obviously the disastrous. <clears throat> Uh, governing of the economy that the government have done uh, recently. This is because we've had 12 years now, 10 years of public sector pay restraint, pay freezes, 1% pay rises. It means that for most of our public sector workers, they are 4% real terms worse off now than they were uh, 10 years ago. This was supposed to be the time that they were getting some payback, and now they're finding themselves with this inflationary uh, pressure much, much uh, worse off. And it's a false economy. That's the other point, because I know nurses, my husband's an A&E doctor. I know that many, many nurses now are either opting out of the profession altogether, or they're choosing to become agency workers and bank workers where they can get often double their salary. That's costing the NHS £7 billion a year to pay for agency now, I know, workers. I know you so, don't want, Labour doesn't want to commit to a, a, an absolute figure now, but are you saying that Labour would offer nurses more than the government is currently offering? Well, the government aren't really offering very much. They're not even having a conversation no, with, with well, nurses. In terms of everybody, they're going along with that. Would you offer more than that? Well, you've got to get round the table. This is completely unprecedented. Well, have a proper negotiation. The, the pay rise it's would be £1,400. It, it's not just about pay, actually. I think for a lot of uh, our public sector okay. workers, they are on the front line. They're facing a lot of stress, uh, huge backlogs, huge waiting lists, huge pressures, getting a lot of abuse in, in their uh, working life as well. So you need to get round the table and resolve okay. it. We never had these strikes when Labour wins in government. We didn't have them on this scale that we're seeing at the moment. And the rhetoric we're seeing from the government is ramping it okay. up rather than resolving it. We're in a spotty top. Hello. Um, two things about public service pay and the independent pay review bodies. Um, how can you say that they're independent when actually the government sets the remit for how <coughs> they actually work and suggest their, um, their, you know, their conclusions? And secondly, um, in teaching, we have currently uh, been given a pay award. Um, I certainly wouldn't say pay rise, but it's actually up to individual schools to uplift the pay to that level. The government haven't fully funded the pay award, so even if the peer review body has said, yes, give them 5%, for example, this year, the schools are having to get it out of their existing budgets. Can you tell me how that's fair? OK, I'll come back to that, guy. Uh, um, without proper funding, as, as that lady's just said there, then we cannot continue to, to have public services. If you don't put the money in from central government, we cannot afford to pay people. I'm a firefighter. I've lost 12% over the last 10 years, which is about £4,000 a year. Um, and my wife's a nurse. We're, we're going out on strike, or we're, and I'm balloting for strike. And it's not out of greed. It's out of necessity. It's out of fair pay. That's what we need. As a, as a country, without the, the hard work that we've put in over the pandemic, and it's a testament to those who have put in that hard work and gone out and carried on working, that we've managed to get through this, and the government needs to show appreciation for that with hard cash. And when, when, <laughs> when you hear the argument from the government that they, they're worried about big pay rises or, or bigger pay rises than they want to, to give, fueling inflation, what do you think of that? Well, inflation is already uh, stratospheric at the minute. Um, if, if we don't fund people, the economy isn't going to grow. Um, if, if you haven't got the workers going out there paying money for products, how are you going to get the economy to grow to get inflation down? OK. Yes, well. I, I mean, the reality is, yes, Britain is broken. Look around you. It seems to me that nothing works. The NHS isn't just at breaking point. In my view, it is broken. We're going to have to do a great deal to rescue it. We've lost control of our borders. You look around and, you know, the trains aren't working. There's a postal strike. You've, you talked about firefighters. It just seems that the country is in a complete state of disarray. And this at a time when the government is taking taxes at a rate of 70-year historic high. That doesn't stack up. And I, I just wonder uh, to the employment minister here whether 
we would actually be in the sorry situation that we're in with nurses right now if you and your government had not offered nurses the insulting rate of a 1% pay rise during the pandemic. Do you think that that was a reasonable offer? So listen, last year they had a 3% pay rise. Lucy talked about the pay rise offer that is on the table. It's £1,400. Uh, there are the lowest paid nurse would receive uh, approximately 9% increase on the independent pay <coughs> review. And bluntly, there is uh, a difficult circumstance that this country and all countries are facing by reason of what Putin is doing, the massive increase in energy costs, and all countries are facing these problems. We are having to try and live within our means, control inflation, and bear down on the difficult situation that we face. But, but we have, not, we have nowhere near shared, enough though, nurses. We have nowhere near enough. Look at the well, scale the of vacancies. The number of nurses is 32,000 more than September 2019. But it's nowhere near enough. You're not going to get enough by paying them a derisory amount. But the amount. facts are wrong. We have 32,000 more nurses than yeah, we had three, three, three years ago. Is that enough? But demand, we've, got massive, we've got massive vacancies and demand is, is much higher. You haven't answered the question. Is that enough? Do we well, have enough nurses? Listen, the, the fact that we are recruiting so many more, the fact that there are new medical schools it's coming in for doctors, we are making huge strides of getting more coming through. But there's not enough. Can I come, can I come in on this? There's so many aspects of it. Let's just deal with that last one. There's not enough nurses. No, there, there aren't enough nurses. Maybe if we hadn't shut our borders to our friends in Europe oh, and all God. these doctors and nurses <laughs> hadn't gone home, that wouldn't be at least one of the issues <laughs> we have to face. Also, if we, if we take the point that was originally made, inflation at 9, 10, 11%, most people who are working today have never seen inflation like that in their lives. They've never seen the erosion of their salaries like that in their lives. So it's no wonder people are balloting to strike. The one thing that strikes me is that most people who are balloting to strike do not want to go on strike. They just want the government to negotiate with them. And I have to say... <laughs> I support the right to strike if the government won't even negotiate a fair deal. That it, it's not good, no one wants to see it, but I think it's the right thing to do. And there's one other final point I'd like to add on this. In Scotland, the council workers got a settlement which they agreed to. In Scotland, the ScotRail workers got a settlement they were prepared to agree to. What about the teachers who went on strike I'm just, today? And I'm, I'm just coming to that. The teachers and the nurses, those negotiations are ongoing. But therein lies the thing. The ministers are actually negotiating. UK ministers need to negotiate with the workforces who are on strike. And worse than that, they need to stop scuppering negotiations, which is now a, a theme which is developing throughout the Labour movement. Well, I think the, the question was, is, is, it, is, 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 Britain our, is Britain broken? And I think quite plainly, it feels like we are. Almost in, in, in every government, uh, in, in every government um, administered area of our lives, things are not working. Uh, and, 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 and I don't, you know, we've, we've privatised most of the sectors that we're talking about not working. You know, the trains that, you know, we were told, when we were told when, it was, when, when trains were privatised, we, we were told we would get better, better train services and we would get uh, cheaper train tickets. And neither of those things have, have turned out. Mm. We privatised the power and we now pay more for power than we ever have done. Um, we privatised water. You know, our sewage companies are pumping water into the sea, uh, pumping sewage, in, our water companies are pumping sewage into the sea. Um, our ambulance workers are about to go on strike, but our ambulances can't, even deliver patients to hospitals because hospitals can't get people out of hospital because there's no social care. My mum spent 10 hours in the back of an ambulance outside Wishaw Hospital with a spine infection that kept her in hospital three, for three weeks about four months ago because the ambulances couldn't unload her into the hospital because the whole pipeline of health care <clears throat> and social care is completely and utterly jammed and broken. The police service is at breaking point. There are no police officers to deal with the social problems that the care system should be there to deal with. Absolutely every part of what we, you know, we, we as individuals expect to be provided for us by the government is broken. And I don't accept the argument that, 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 that power is all the fault of Putin. Of course, we are suffering from that. But we have failed. Like, the wind blows across this windy old country every single day. For the last 15 years, we could have been building windmills. 
We could have been, you know, we are totally, you know, we have an energy policy that does not protect us from shocks outside of our system. We, you know, we've let go control of so many things that ought to be in our control. And I agree entirely with you, you know, it does feel like it's at, at breaking point. And I have every sympathy with strikers. You know, a decade of austerity has absolutely crippled the income of so many people, and now we've got rising costs. It's, you know, it's a double, an absolute double whammy. I have every sympathy <laughs> for the cycle. Lots of hands up. Let's hear from some of you. All in there in the, in the blue and the colourful top. I'm a district nursing sister. I don't want to strike, but I cannot recruit ban five nurses into post. There is one in eight empty nursing posts out there. What does the government expect us to do? The NHS is run on goodwill and has been for many years, but that goodwill has run out now because we can't deliver the care that we want to deliver to our patients and we're struggling to keep up a decent standard of living for our families. We don't want to strike. We want fair pay, fair conditions and better services for patients. OK, I'll come back to you guys. Yeah, hi. Um, I'm a HR manager. My daughter works in HR for the NHS in recruitment. And um, I can tell you now, she deals with hundreds of vacancies. There is no administrational staff at that level. You've got people starting out in their careers as administrators, and they're dealing with thousands of vacancies with no experience. You haven't got leaders in HR within the NHS people that are capable, professionals that know what to do to fill vacancies, you know, cut down on time to fill vacancies. So hence the fact, you know, in the one trust local, three hospitals together, thousands of vacancies with very, very few administrational staff. Okay. The man, man at the back with the grey sweater, yes. Um, the NHS workers, I think they were a formidable job. Um, my sister-in-law, she started a shift the other night and when she started she had 75 children on her ward that was when she started um, and some of them she couldn't get round she comes back home broken um, and I think it's an utter disgrace that the government's allowed the NHS to get into such a state that people do far more for you like to mankind and they're just tossed out um, which also brings us back a lot of these NHS workers as well, a lot of them from where I live are farmers' wives, which brings us on to another little bit of a topic, as of the farmers themselves are struggling at the moment. Right. And NHS workers, the, the, the nurses and things, they're going home and they're seeing the husbands in bits because at the moment the farming crisis is getting out of hand. We are facing an uncertain future. Um, are we going to end up in the same crisis as the NHS? Okay. Because we've got the NHS that look after you, and we've got the farmers such as us that feed you. And if something's <coughs> not done in the next couple of years, there is going to be a major crisis in this country. And I would like to ask the panel, now, do you support British agriculture? OK, I'm going to stick, stick with strikes at the moment, forgive yeah. me, but I, I realise that's something, this is something that farmers feel very strongly about, and I hear what you say. Can I, can I just ask, it, it's very clear that the the wave of sympathy we're getting for, for, for strikers and, and the real pain we're hearing from, from people who are affected by it and in those industries. Can I ask, is there anyone here in the audience who's oppo who opposes the strikes? Yes, let's hear from a couple of you. Yes, the man there in the maroon yeah, sweater. I feel like it's a bit of a contradiction to say that uh, Britain's broken and yet the, 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 we also support strike action. You know, we, we would love to give public sector workers more money, but the reality is the, the private sector is not seeing any more money. Um, and the fact of the matter is there is no money. There's no money to give. So if we, if we open the floodgates for negotiations with all these different uh, unions, then I would, I'd like to know where the money's coming from. And, and just beyond that, it's looking increasingly <laughs> likely that Labour might win the next election. Um, so I'd like to know where they think or how they think they're going to fund all these extra pay increases. Um, when the reality is the, the, the economy's in such a mess, the money's not there to just pay these people what they want. OK, man in the, in the pale grey sweater here. Um, well, just to re uh, reiterate what he said, um, we live in unprecedented times with COVID and, um, you know, the, the debt that that has burdened us with, as well as um, what's happen happening in Russia and Ukraine. 
And if, if we are to recruit all these extra nurses, police officers, etc., 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 and give all these public sector workers whatever they want, how would Labour fund that? OK, I, I'm going to come back to Lucy on that. And the man there in the middle with the grey jacket and the dark sweater, yes, you. Is the difficulty not further compounded following the decision to increase uh, pensioner rates and benefit rates by 10% from April? Um, so you're that, talking about maintaining the triple lock? Yeah, that must make hard-working people feel very frustrated. You know, I think rail workers have been offered an 8% deal over two years. Pensioners and benefits recipients, 10.1% from April. There's more of a, uh, an incentive not to work than work. OK, listen, let's come back to some of the questions that you've put directly to, uh, to, to Guy and to Lisa. So, so, Guy, I mean, we heard from the teacher there um, talking about how independent are these independent pay bodies really when the government can, can set the parameters, and also about individual school pay settlements. And then, of course, we heard from, from your, your nurse, you said, didn't you? From the nurse there and, and how difficult it is to recruit people. So there's a lot to answer there. Let's start with the basics on NHS funding. NHS funding is dramatically up from 123 billion up to 162 billion. In fairness, Guy, that's not what you're being asked. What no, you're being asked I'm is about, about five is about, different questions. No, there. you're being asked two very specific things, which is one, you were making the point that there just aren't enough nurses and you can't, you can't recruit nurses. And the point you're making is about independent pay bodies for All schools. Right, on, the nurses, are they? on the nurses' point, nurses are up 32,000. Uh, and obviously, since 2019. Um, since 2019. What about since 2010, when the gazette? Oh, and the came nurses out? are up again as well. There's no question whatsoever. And we've got two no different medical demand schools. Demand has obviously increased as of well. Of course. Listen, we all accept that there is a greater demand on the NHS. Mm -hmm. At the same stage, there are independent pay review bodies. I don't think anybody is saying that these things <clears> should <throat> be got rid of. It is the traditional way which everybody has run. Uh, public sector pay negotiations on a long-term basis. I just do want to answer two quick points. Oh, so you could choose to override an independent pay body if you, if you so chose. Um, that's a matter, obviously, for uh, prime ministers and things like that. But my personal view is, if you have an independent pay review body, you've got to stick to what the independent pay review body does. You do set the does. parameters of that. Well, the government sets very tight parameters of that. I don't, so to I say don't, that it's entirely that. without parameters. No, it has to be, it has to be something that is an independent pay review body. Within parameters that, looks that you set. That obviously, government has a non executive role in all these things, but bluntly, you have to look as to how we live within our means. And I'll just on hospital discharges, there is money going through, there's £500 million specifically to ensure hospital discharges. And on the vulnerability point, no disrespect to the um, money going to pensioners and the most vulnerable. That is with an inflationary pay rise of 10.1%. That was a conscious decision taken to protect the most vulnerable, and it is something I'm very proud we're doing. OK. A question for you, Lucy. As we heard from the two men there, how would Labour afford to pay for pay rises? Well, look, the economy is in a mess. I mean, there's no two ways about that. And it's not just because of external factors. We've had very low growth. We've had... Uh, stagnant wages uh, and we, uh, over a long period of time <coughs> and we've had austerity that has, has further exacerbated so all of that. So you've got to get growth in the economy in order to pay for our uh, public services and we've got a plan for growth as, as business leaders are now saying Labour's the only party with, uh, with a real uh, plan for growth. But, but obviously as I was, takes time. But as I, in the world. So a, a couple of things to say. As I was saying earlier, there is a false economy to these things because if you have huge chronic job shortages in our frontline services, which we have at the moment, as has been testified by many of the people here this evening, then you end up paying a lot more in agency staff and for bank staff, and you pay a lot more for the cost of that. With what we've seen today, the highest waiting times, wait, longest waiting lists ever in history, 7 million people on that. And there's a cost to the economy of that, because that's people often who then can't work because they are unhealthy and they are uh, then not being able to be productively uh, in work as well. So these things cost the economy too. But we do have a very specific uh, proposal, which is also about fairness and who actually pays for these crises, which is getting rid of the non-domicile non tax status, which would raise uh, over £3 billion a year. And we will put that directly into recruiting 7,500 more doctors and 10,000 and, and uh, more nurses. Because I do take issue with this point. It's funny how, in these times of crisis, there's still people who can, um, in the Tory crony uh, PPE contracts, can kind of peel off 26, 29 million pounds and put it into their own bank. <laughs> they're, they're not paying the price <laughs> of these prices. 
So we've, lur we've lurched from crisis to crisis with this government, but it's not fair who pays the price, and it's not fair to ask our, our nurses and our frontline okay, workers who it. stood by us in COVID to do that. Is it quickly? I, I was super interested in what you said about a shortage of administrators, because actually I tend to think there are usually too many of them, but I suspect that where there are too many, it's right at the top end. I was just having a look very quickly before we came in here at the type of jobs available. I wondered, Guy, if you know, what is a director of lived experience? This is in the NHS. Yeah, what, what is that? That you weren't expecting that question tonight, were you? No, I wasn't, and I have no idea. <laughs> well, well, neither do I, but that is a job within the NHS in a trust in the okay, Midlands, we get which, the point pay, which pays <laughs> six figures. That is a six-figure right, salary. If anyone's got, does anyone know what the answer to that question is? No. OK, right. Well, right. answers on a postcard, please. Right, I'm going to move on. But before I do, I just want to tell you that um, next week is our last programme for Christmas and mm. we will be in Winchester in Hampshire, where, among others, we will have Jacob Rees-Mogg, haven't heard from him for a bit, uh, and Peter Hitchens on the panel. So I don't think you want to miss that. Uh, yeah. If you'd like to be part of our audience, go to the website, follow the instructions there and come along and see us in Winchester next Thursday. Right, let's take our second question now, which is, where are you? Paul Smith. Does the building of a new coal mine damage the government's net zero campaign? Right, so this is the announcement yesterday of the new coal mine in Cumbria. It's the first coal mine in 30 years in the UK. Um, Lucy? Well, it, it does obviously clearly damage the government's uh, leadership role that it needs to play in uh, taking this country towards a kind of net zero future, but also the leadership role it plays in the world. But what I first of all want to say is that I think you know, communities like we're in today in Bishop Auckland, uh, communities in Cumbria and, and elsewhere that once powered our country, once built our country, that have seen decades of decline and neglect uh, where they haven't seen the good jobs coming in that they used to have and that's had an effect on the high street and on the local economy and on the status of, uh, of the whole community. I understand deeply that desire to get some good, decent jobs in the community. But I don't think that reopening a coal mine, for, for which there is now a really diminishing market for this kind of coal, UK Steel said they won't buy it uh, anyway, they can't uh, use it. It's a, going to be a very short market window that we see. What we really need is to see the good green jobs of the future coming into Cumbria and places like Bishop uh, Auckland, because we've got real opportunity for this country to lead the world in some of these green jobs of the future in <coughs> offshore wind, which is now far cheaper anyway than fossil fuels in terms of energy supply and our energy security, uh, green hydrogen, uh, nuclear as well that once powered uh, Cumbria uh, too. We've got a real opportunity to seize and lead the world in these technologies and these jobs and skills of the future, but we're not investing in them in the way that we should. So Cumbria deserves that prosperous uh, future of, of once having uh, powered the UK to power the UK again, but this coal field is not the solution to that problem. And I'm afraid I think they've been uh, sold a bit of a yarn on that. OK. Um... <clears throat> Guy, in 2019, you opposed the building of a coal mine in your own constituency. Uh, you said this is the wrong approach on a multitude of levels, particularly when we're doing so much to address climate change. I do not want to see a new coal mine casting a shadow on our vital green lungs. So I presume you don't support this one either. Uh, no, I do support this. And I'll explain, yeah. the, no, I'll explain the difference. What that was proposed, that was a proposal for a coal mine for energy uh, production. Uh, this is not... Hang uh, on a second. Because when I read up on it, it said it was for coke coal for steel production. That's not right, then. No, not right. So the Whittenstall mine and the uh, open cast mine that was going to take place at Halton the Gate, both of those were for energy production. What we're talking about here is coking coal. Coking coal that presently we import from Russia. It is utterly insane, in my respectful opinion, that we pay money to Putin and then import all the way from Russia coking coal to make steel. And if we as a country decide we need steel to build buildings like the one we're in now or to build uh, manufacturing on an ongoing basis, which we clearly do, then you have to have coking coal. So it is a simple question for us. Are we producing the, the material to make steel in this country or are we importing it with all the impacts that has and the fact that by and large this is coming from uh, Russia? Now, there are various things you should read in the 419-page report 
uh, that was uh, issued to, uh, yesterday by the planning inspector. But the planning <coughs> inspector made very, very clear a couple of key points. This will have a neutral effect on climate That's change. That's not true. Well, it's a paragraph 22.9, so I just suggest it's not what you... Your own things, it's not what your own climate committee can I, can I just it ask you about that? It is neutral on climate change. Can I just ask Read that? the independent planning inspector. Your own independent climate change committee doesn't say that. Because they haven't actually read the report. Well, what's what's it? Well, no, no, just clarify one thing for us, because I, I, I was just following this obviously reasonably closely. I thought it might come up today. And it, it may be that I've misunderstood this, but as I understand it, they came to that conclusion on the basis of the carbon emissions you'd get from digging the coal out of the ground. What it doesn't include is the carbon emissions from burning that coal. Is that right? So, you're asking something about a 419-page report. Bluntly... Well, it's just because you quoted it, so no, I'm no, assuming you're all no, over no, it. No, so they... I, I have tried to read it all on my way here tonight. So, bluntly, they are making the assertion, the independent planning inspector, that this is something that is carbon neutral, that it does not impact on climate change when you look at all the amelioration measures that they're taking on the site. And it's the equivalent, point it's is, equivalent to two million cars on the road. This, no, it is not. Yes, it is. And that's the independent climate change it is committee, not. your independent climate change committee, that have said that. As and I, and as you're, I you're, also, you're also it. wrong but, about steel because steel is all around the world, especially in Europe, are switching to electric furnaces themselves you can't to green produce steel. All the steel we, you want in and, that way. And we should be you know at that. the fore, we should be at the forefront of that. UK steel We're and Tata have said We're they won't use that. this coking coal. It's the wrong kind of coking coal for British steel. We will be using this type of steel on an ongoing basis for the next 25 years. We don't years. need to. We don't need to. Well, we Lucy, I mean, at the moment, at the moment, we are importing millions of of tons of coal. That is a reality. I actually agree with you on this one. I mean, I care about climate change. I want to protect the environment, but it's not green to be shipping a load of coal over from Russia, from Australia. I mean, last year, 300,000 tons of coal we actually brought over from Australia. How does that make sense? Because we when we be, can produce we should, it, we should, be we, should we should be investing in switching steel to green. But we and then can't we can do lead that. the world in that right. as well. Hold we can't on. do that we overnight. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Wait, you're all talking at yeah. the same time. Let Isabel finish. Right. Before we, we, before can't, we can't do that overnight. And it, it, you so know, Isabel, the fact that 85% of this coal is going to be exported, presumably also on ships, does that... Well, <laughs> I didn't know that, but that's interesting. Well, but that, that, that's but equally, the, the, equally, the other the point I would like saying, the other that? point I would like to make is that the government this week was busy boasting about its incredible deal with America to import a load of shale gas. I mean, why don't we use our own shale gas rather than bringing it over here, exporting all the jobs to America? That's not moral. And nor is it green, it's okay. just stupid. So you, I'm going to come to you in a minute, I can see you, you're chomping yeah, the bit. Yeah. I just want to hear from the audience just a minute, so forgive me. Right, lots of hands up, where shall I start? Yes, we're at the back with the glasses. Um, a former director of British Steel has actually said that this, this mine isn't needed. He actually said that um, hydrogen should be being produced and that the blast furnaces should, should be fire, electric ones. Mm -hmm. um, it just seems madness. Yes, just, just to quote him, he said, even if this mine opened tomorrow, it would not displace a single tonne of Russian coking coal from the UK. I can say that with confidence. That's, that's what... It's, this is Chris, Chris. MacDonald. Yeah, no, yes, the man here in the blue t-shirt. about uh, electric furnaces for um, creating... Uh, for steel. Um, where do you think the electricity comes from? The coal-fired uh, power stations. So, you know... Well, there you go. Okay. Yeah, well, well, we reduced so coal fire. So we used to yeah. uh, literally ten years ago, 2012. Forty percent of our energy production was by coal. We're now down to pretty much one percent. So we have changed dramatically away from a coal-fired energy-producing country into a much more renewable, much more nuclear, much more uh, traditional gas uh, approach. So we're not utilising okay. uh, coal in energy production, and that stops in 2024 totally. The man in the white shirt and the grey jacket. If uh, coal mines are CO2 neutral, why are we telling the rest of the world to stop using them? Exactly. There's going to be a lot of questions coming your way in a minute, I suspect, Guy, and we'll store that one up. Uh, well, yes, the uh, guy there in the blue shirt and white, blue and white shirt. I'm glad that nuclear power was mentioned. That it seems to be one of the safest and cheapest mm -hmm. and actually cleanest ways to produce power. Yet there seems to have been an unwillingness on all sides um, of politics to actually invest not just in things like that, but make sort of those long-term investments that seem to be, at least to me, the reason that politics is broken. Man at the very back. Is the coal mine not just another way to give um, VIP lane customers a load of money? 
Right, OK, and we'll, we'll get that answered as well. But let me bring in uh, the <laughs> Stuart, you want to... Yeah, do, look, I, I, I'm really trying to feel sympathy for Guy here. If the government had said they're committed to their net zero targets, if they'd explained that during the transition to net zero there'd still be a requirement for uh, coal, if they'd said that every single tonne of this coal would be turned into coking coal and used to create steel, they might just have had a case. But the point that 85% of this is to be exported just blows a complete hole through this entire charade. I think the point Patrick made earlier is that we must move more quickly, not just to solve this problem, but more quickly to renewables to help us solve the environmental problem. And that's really at the heart of that. And this, and this is where we should be and I think the thing, things we should be talking about. It's not just green energy to power homes. It's not just green energy to power businesses. It's actually green energy to provide the energy security we need so that we're no longer importing coking coal or indeed anything else from Russia. Patrick. Uh, strangely, about 30 years ago, I did a degree in material science. I know a tiny bit about How did steel. you go from that to fashion? That's <laughs> quite it's a long leap. story. Um, but there are several things, I think, that, 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 that stink about this story. I mean, I think up until as little as a couple of weeks ago, we had the chair of COP, and we were busy telling the world they needed to stop using coal. I mean, we were in Glasgow, which is probably... You can probably see Cumbria from Glasgow. And, and, you know, we're up there telling the rest of the world to stop using coal, to stop burning coal, to stop digging coal. And yet, you know, 150 miles down the road, we're currently, you know, we're quietly squirrelling away, making plans to do our own new coal mine. I mean, it's just... The hypocrisy of it is, is ridiculous. We are supposed to be a leader in this field, yet we are clearly at the very, very back of the queue and in, in actually advancing a green agenda. But, you know, it's been said before, we, you know, the, the world of steel production has moved on from, from coke. You know, we are moving to uh, hydrogen-based uh, electric furnaces to make steel, and that hydrogen can come in a clean way, and the energy that we need for those electric furnaces can also be clean energy. So we can actually make clean, we can make clean steel. But also, something like 40-odd percent of the world's steel is now being recycled. And again, that needs electricity, which, to your point, can, again, can be produced cleanly. So this feels like an absolutely kind of backward step. You know, we're, we're launching a bunch of money, a load of investment, and getting a load of people's hopes up around an industry that we actually have no idea how much is going to be used. They say it's not going to be used in, in, in power generation, but if nobody buys their, their, their coke for use in steel production, they'll sell it to whoever wants it, because they're not going to dig it out the ground and leave it sitting there. And I think... Um, I did have another point, but I've now forgotten it. Excellent. Um, <laughs> well, you know, a, a great panellist always stops at that moment rather than flannels on, so well done. So, Guy, do you want to answer a couple of questions, Kenny? Sure. A, you at the back were talking about is, is this a VIP lane. Um, and the, the, the basic point that you're making, Patrick, which is when the government is, is telling other countries not to open new coal mines, and we committed last year as a UK government to end investment in new coal power generation domestically and internationally, doesn't this look like double standards? So I think you have to distinguish between energy production, which this country is leading the world in. We are phasing out coal by 2024, as I explained uh, to the gentleman there. We are in a position that we've gone from 40% down to 1%. We will go down to zero within a matter of a year or two. Now, that we are leading the world in. The question is, do we need coking coal on an ongoing basis? And all the evidence that was considered by the planning inspector in his 419-page report, which obviously everyone's going to read tonight, uh, is it very much the case that notwithstanding the importance of nuclear, notwithstanding the importance of building, you know, Sizewell C, progressing Hinkley Point, doing more uh, work at, uh, in Anglesey, doing more work uh, uh, down at, uh, on the Cumbrian coast and getting a cellar field two going. All of those things can happen, but you still need to go down this route as well. Now, it is a balance, as Michael Gove set out in the House of Commons today. It's a balance that we have to consider the appropriate way forward, but it is a very strong distinction between energy production, which it is most definitely this is not, and utilisation of a resource that otherwise we would be importing. And in terms of the man's point at the back about VIP lane? Uh, no, not, not at all. OK. 
And it's also 532 local jobs here in Cumbria. <laughs> We're not here in Cumbria, by the way. We, no, we, I mean, well, let, let, listen, we could, we could yeah. talk about this for some North considerable East, time. Also, there's been a lot of news coverage about this today. There's been a lot of news coverage about another story, and a lot of you put in questions about this, so I'm going to move on to it, because we haven't got that much time left. For, uh, Robbie Morgan, where are you sitting? Ah, let's hear from you. Uh, how much damage have Harry and Meghan caused to the reputation of the royal family? <laughs> Stuart, did you just say, oh, good God? We all, <laughs> we're all taking a big sigh. Sorry. Sorry. Well, listen, the, it's uh, not for me to cast judgment on whether it's a good topic or not, because the way we choose our questions is dictated by how many people want to talk about it, and a lot of you have asked about this. So, let's go for it. So, Patrick, as we know, <laughs> Harry... <laughs> come on, Patrick. <laughs> Harry and Meghan <clears throat> have dropped the first of... first three of a mighty six-part series yeah. about about all their lives, basically, and, and, and exiting from the royal family and, and all of that. Uh, and that happened tonight, so uh, today, so you probably haven't seen it. But how much damage do you think, Robbie's asking, has that caused the reputation of the royal family? Well, from, from the little I've heard, and they were talking about it on the radio as I came over here just now, um, it's, it's, it's largely uneventful. You know, it's, it's three parts that don't really tell us anything particularly new. Um, I, I personally think... It, it, will, it will make so little difference to the royal family that, unless something incredibly shocking appears in the, the episodes to come, I, I don't really mind. I, I'm, I'm very happy for Harry to go on and, and live his life wherever he chooses to live it, with whoever, whomever he chooses to live it, and do it in whatever way he sees fit. I think he's, you know, he's a grown-up, he can do whatever he so likes. do you think it's... The question is, is it damaged the royal family? I, I mean, some of the things has. he's been saying is that... <clears throat> I mean, a lot of it, to be honest, is about, is about media intrusion. Mm. Um, but he's also said that he didn't feel that Meghan was protected, um, and the fact that she is of mixed race was not something that was taken into account, and therefore, because she, he felt she, she needed more protection because of that. Well, I, you know, I don't think anybody comes out of this particularly brilliantly. I think, you know, you get a sense that maybe she could have been looked after a little bit better. I think perhaps she could have, they could have made uh, more of an effort to protect her from the press. But, you know, I think at the, at, at, at the end of the day, I think they are both grown up. They're both public figures. She's been a public figure for a very long time. I think she must have understood what she was getting into. And I... I, I've, I, 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 okay. I fail to understand why everybody is quite so obsessed with it. Isabel. Um, <clears throat> I don't think it's just the Netflix documentary that has done the damage. It's a much broader, ongoing, relentless campaign by the pair of them to bring the monarchy... <laughs> into disrepute, all the while complaining about intrusion into their privacy while sharing ever more stuff about their lives with us. I think they are self-seeking, they are self-indulgent, and they are thoroughly unpatriotic. And I just wonder how hurt the Queen would have been if she had had to go through this still, you know, day after day, more and more, Harry and Meghan. You know, why can't they... If they're going to disappear to America, why don't they just go away and keep their heads down over there, and they'll soon find there's much less media intrusion. I'm here in the red sweater. Um, I just thought they moved to America because they didn't want any more publicity and they wanted a quiet life. And then to hear they had 88 million from Netflix... Well, we don't, in fairness, we don't know how much they got. Well, it'd be it's a lot of a money. Pound. I wonder how much yeah. of that's going to go to charity. Probably not much. Um, but we don't, don't know that either. No. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, um, you know, it's a lot of money. Obviously, they're going to be paid for this. And I thought they wanted to go and be anonymous. And this doesn't feel like being anonymous. I don't think it'll have harmed the royal family. I just think they just look dreadful doing this. They really do. OK. A woman at the back there in the glasses. Um, I think a lot of people um, fail to recognise that Harry was born into this and when he stepped down, he still needed to have security for his family. So even though people are sort of berating him for his decisions, he does need to make money and, and that's not necessarily easy for someone who's been born into the royal family. So I think there is an element that sometimes does get missed. And sort of degree of, of, of a lack of sympathy yeah, for him. Yeah, yeah. And it's predicament. Woman here. <clears throat> I've never understood is when Meghan had the interview with Oprah Winfrey, mm. she complained about feeling suicidal while she was in England, um, mm. when she was first married and while she was pregnant, and that she asked for help and she never got it. And yet Harry and William and Kate all really went 
for this mental health prior to that and boosting mental, the mental health image and how much people needed it and how much support they needed. So it doesn't make sense to me that if she'd asked for help, that she wouldn't have got it. Well, she says she didn't. I mean, that's, <clears throat> that's, that's all we know. Uh, Stuart. Come on. Does the, <laughs> Come on, put it on the line, Stuart. What do you does think? Does the expose by Harley and Meghan, will that damage the royal family? No, it won't. I think the royal family have had to deal with far more serious and real problems than this. And I was interested, though, that you said, Isabel, there's a relentless campaign against the monarchy. I don't think there is. And it's, of course, it's not just the programme. I mean, you can take yeah. the question more widely. I, I, I don't think there is. What about last week and the whole oh, issue of racism that came up again? I well, mean, that was pretty well, unhelpful. And in, well, in accepting the... Well, let's... let's, let's, let's but that, that was nothing to do with Harry and Meghan. Well, yes, but we're talking about the campaign against the monarchy no. on the issue of racism. And Harry and Meghan last night, whenever it was, earlier this week, accepted <laughs> that award for combating racism. It was quite obvious that that was going to be interpreted as a slight on the royal family. Well, listen... Given the background. I think if people are going to interpret someone receiving an award and engaging this kind of Kremlinology, we end I don't up... don't think it is. We end up talking about all sorts of very strange things. I think the thing that really struck me most was, you know, people have said, you know, they offered up access, they let the media into their lives. That was controlled access. That's rather different to be chased down the street or through a road tunnel by the paparazzi. I understand, I think, why they're so anxious about the way they've been treated. The monarchy, this'll come and go... I hope these people can just live a happy life. I really do. A happy, safe and secure life. <clears throat> but all of this beasting of them, they're out to destroy the monarchy. What utter drivel. OK, let's say a couple of quick words. Uh, the guy with the, in, the, in the fleece. The guy in the fleece, the coloured fleece. <laughs> yes. Um, I agree with what Patrick was saying there. I fail to see how this uh, drama is relevant to the British people. Um, OK. And how it affects me or anybody at all in this country it just seems like petty drama that we're focusing on way too much okay and the man there in the in sort of check shirt in the back black one. <clears throat> i think my question is has the uk government not done more damage with the scandals that it's had to the royal family itself rather than Meghan and harry oh right well i didn't, didn't see that coming okay well i was <laughs> going to come to you so you can answer both those things then guy so i think they are clearly a very troubled couple and which I think anybody looking at them can say is a sad state of affairs. That having been said, I agree that they are utterly irrelevant to this country and the progress that this country and the royal family that we all, I believe, support. I do think there is a legitimate question as to media intrusion into some people's uh, private lives. That is an ongoing debate which quite clearly the degree of extent to which their lives are picked over is something that, when they were living here, was unacceptable. Um, I don't think it has a fundamental impact on the royal family. I certainly won't be watching it. I would urge everyone to boycott Netflix and make sure that we actually focus on the things that matter, many of which we've been talking about tonight. And the man's point about scandals in the government? Um, listen, the royal family is bigger than all of us. Lucy. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard to get too excited about uh, this particular So, I mean, you call it a drama, and it, it's, it's coming sort of hot off the heels of the latest series of The Crown, which I actually really enjoy, because I think it's a, it's a good um, sort of dramatisation of, of British history over the, over the last uh, century. But I think, like other people have said, this is quite a sad story, I think, really, of uh, people in public life who've... Uh, been a unable to, to sort of cope with that because of the intrusion and all that all the, that comes uh, with that and it's a sort of sad story of a family breakup that's happening uh, in public uh, view I don't think it's uh, kind of damaging. damaging the royal family particularly um, you know I think there's very very strong support for the royal family in this country I think they uh, on the whole do a really good job for this uh, country in projecting Britain around the world and getting investment into this country and um, you know showing us for who who we are and actually I think what's the saddest about it is that Harry and Meghan as a couple could have been a really big part of, of that uh, royal yeah, family of the future. Okay. All right we've got about nine minutes left I'm gonna take one more question um, from Natasha Wilkes please. Should the House of Lords be abolished? Right. Well, Lucy, we know what you think, because this is obviously something that Labour's proposing, so I'll come here <laughs> in a moment. 
Isabel, let's kick off with you. Um, I think that the upper house does have a role to play, but not as it is currently. I mean, I was Should just... Should we just explain, just in case... And, and Forgive me if you, you're completely across this already, but just in mm. case people aren't 100% sure what the House of Lords actually does. It, it, it scrutinises, it has debates, obviously, as you know, it scrutinises and suggests amendments to bills that are going through the House of Commons, but what it, it doesn't do is, what it cannot do is act against the will of the House of Commons. So it's a kind of advisory body, if you like. Yeah, so it should be about bringing expertise, people that are outstanding in their fields, bringing in their special knowledge and their scrutiny of legislation to make it better. What it should not be about is paying very large sums of money to political parties in order to effectively buy membership of the House of Lords and then going on to use that membership of the House of Lords to commercialise, to, to pursue your own interests and feather your own nest. And I'm sorry to say that Michelle Moon, uh, the erstwhile Conservative uh, peer is a classic example of everything that is wrong with the House of Lords. This is somebody who has made, on average, one contribution a year. Once a year, she has contributed to debates in the House of Lords. She's not spoken since March 2020, and yet she saw fit to use her position in order to further uh, feather her nest, gaining millions of pounds uh, at a time when this country was facing a big public health crisis. If ever there I mean, was I just, a symbol... Obviously, obviously, I need to say, Isabel, that that's an allegation which she denies. I think and, quite and, a lot Well, listen, let me say this, because, you know, uh, Baroness, she has consistently... I have to say this. Yeah. Uh, she has consistently denied any role or function in the company that you're referring to, which is PPE MedPro. So I have seen some of the correspondence <laughs> because I worked with Matt Hancock on his book. I have seen some of the correspondence that she sent to the health secretary and I found it pretty disturbing, I have to say. And I think she was right to take a step back. But look, this isn't about her. It is about the bigger picture. Uh, and I would welcome the reform of the House of Lords. The SNP don't take seats in the House of Lords for many of the reasons which have just been explained and which many of you know about. But as to what it is, it's a revising chamber, it can amend legislation, it can delay it, but it can't stop it. The real question is, do you even need a second chamber to do that? Or can you do that within a monocameral single chamber approach? Uh, and our view is, do away with the second chamber, with the cost, remove the unelected, remove the patronage, and introduce into the House of Commons a significant minority blocking clause that would force a subsequent reading of a bill, which in essence is the only thing the House of Lords can do. Get rid of the pomp, get rid of the ceremony, get rid of the patronage, make sure the whole thing is democratic. I think the public would see absolutely no difference to the way legislation proceeded or didn't and through the Houses of Parliament. <clears throat> so, Lucy. This is something that Labour is proposing. I mean, one of the criticisms of it has been how much does this matter to people, given everything else that's going on? Well, the first thing I want to say is I didn't think I'd come here this, this evening and say I completely agree with Isabel and what she just said. So uh, there's a new alliance uh, I wasn't planning on this evening. <laughs> but look, this is part of a bigger plan we've got for uh, redistributing kind of power around this country about how our country works and in whose interest it works and who it works for and who has a say in how our country works. So we, we I think we're the first party in a long time that wants to win power in order to give power away to uh, all different parts of the country, to local government, to the regions, to our metro mayors, to Scotland, Wales and the devolved administrations uh, as well. And reforming the House of Lords, which is a revising chamber, that's what it does. It's there to, to make legislation better. And I think it, it, it does a pretty good job uh, at that, given its constraints, notwithstanding that there are uh, people in there for, for the wrong reasons, but, but there are many good people in there at the moment. It is a revising chamber, <laughs> but it needs okay. fundamental reform so that it can be uh, elected and it can represent all parts of the country and people have a say over how oh. it's operating. I'm, I'm going to come around you, but you need to be quite brief. I haven't got much time left. Yes, the woman here in the front in the black sweater. Um, I think what's been really interesting this evening is we started with um, 
is Britain broken? We've talked about opening co um, coal mines in Cumbria, total lack of vision for the, for the north of England, and we're talking about the House of Lords and whether we should reform it. Actually, I'm completely with Stuart here. You know, we need to be thinking more radical than that. And as for the monarchy representing all of us and showing the best of Britain, again, not relatable. Um, we need to be thinking about the future. We need to be thinking about a vision for this country. And as somebody from, from the northeast, a vision for the northeast as well. But coal mines, monarchy, and um, the House of Lords are not part of it. Okay. We're here in the front of I wonder what the panel thinks about, obviously the House of Lords does, does do a role in scrutiny and very well I would say, and doesn't actually hold that much power. Um, how much does the panel think is significant in all of the pomp? How much do you think it's significant that it's quite an integral part of the history of Britain and how we see ourselves? Okay, go on. So a lot to unpick there. So I think... We've got three minutes left on the programme. Okay. <laughs> You do need a revising chamber. It does need reform. We are already devolving huge amounts of power. So you'll have a Teesside mayor, a Manchester mayor. You've got the um, LA7, the local authorities coming together here uh, in the northeast. Uh, that is already happening. I wouldn't have turned to Gordon Brown as the solution for anything, personally. Mm -hmm. um, the man who sold the goal and uh, wrecked the economy in 2008 was not my solution. Uh, there is a work After to be Liz done. Trust and quasi Oof, Gordon Brown's uh... much worse for Jeremy Corbyn. <laughs> wow. be abolished? Uh, no, it should not be abolished. You need to reform it and improve it. Patrick? I think there's always a role for, for a kind of wise old head to scrutinise and just kind of put the brakes on and just a little bit of check and balance on these things. So I think there is a role for it. I personally would be looking also to review the, 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 the way the House of Commons is elected. I think it is currently not possible to vote for a party that really represents you. We've got We've got a, a, a party on the right that really should be three parties. We've got a party on the left that should probably be at least two parties. We can't vote for what we want for. So I'd be looking at reforming the House of Commons as well as reforming the House of Commons. On there in the white top. Yes. In, um, in response to what Guy said, um, in terms of uh, reforming it, do you agree that maybe it, uh, the House of Lords should become democratically elected, as we see um, the House and the Senate, for example, or maybe abolish the hereditary peers that are currently in the House of Lords? OK, let's hear from the guy here in the black top. If the House of Lords became an elected house, how would you ensure that the government still has long-term thinking within like, the government as a whole? OK. Does it have long-term thinking right now, yeah. the government? All I right. would say it's very You've short. I think one of the challenges we have with our governmental system is the, is the short electoral cycles and the short-term yeah. thinking. And I think the idea would be that the revising second chamber, the term is a lot longer, so that you, you have that sort of uh, over a longer term. Oh, in terms of revising the House of Lords, what about having it entirely democratically elected? Is um, that something you would I consider? don't think elections for the House of Lords is the way ahead. I really don't because you will end up with more professional politicians. You will lose the benefit of the House of Lords, which is you have everything from uh, neurologists to scientists to specialists to who actually contribute... Prime ministers. Uh, ..who contribute hugely to the House of Lords to and of, to the to debates as well. lots of Tory well. donors and cronies, yeah. We, I have to say... Um, I'm afraid to say that we are out of time. We had one last question which we were going to squeeze in, so, Margaret, given we haven't, which was, could this be England's year at the World Cup? Just a show of hands. Because it's the, it's the quarterfinals on Saturday. Is yes. this England's year? Yes. Uh, come on. Typically, the one year that we, you know, we're not that happy about where it's being hosted. It's typical, <laughs> isn't it? Anyway, right, OK. Thank so, on that note, our hour is up. Thank you very much to the panel. Thank you very much to the audience here in Bishop Auckland for coming along. Very good to see you. Don't forget, next week we are in, uh, in Winchester and we will have Jacob rees mogg and Peter Hitchens on the panel, amongst others. So make sure you, you tune in to watch. But for tonight, from Bishop Auckland, from all of us here, Bye-bye.